Hi, welcome to another lesson. We'll set up a nighttime scenario from scratch, based on what we have learned previously. If you missed the previous lesson, definitely look that up before we dive into practice. We touch base on the workflow that we will implement today. We will approach lighting in four steps, starting from the atmospheric lighting, through adding lights inside and outside the building to landscape lighting. Today, we will give you all the tools to execute this scenario. So this will be a packed lesson, nearly two hours long. We hope you can push through and gain some nuggets of knowledge along the way. At the same time, we want to inspire you to sort of cheat in visualizations and just get things done. After this lesson, I think you'll understand what we meant. So without further ado, let's jump into practice. We immediately jump into production. And just like we said the last time, we want to create a certain base. It will be the atmospheric light that will provide a certain readability of silhouettes and materials. It will be quite dark, but it should look pretty natural. And to do it, we'll use an HDRI. In our case, We'll choose PG Skies 1958. PG Skies 2028 is also good. It has a nice clean gradient on the sky. And if you're looking for a dramatic clouds, the 3D Collective 1846 is a great choice too. It is not included in our training, but it is a great one either way. If you want to mix it up and don't use PG Skies this time, you can always use 3D Collective 2257 which is actually included in this training. Already put boxes in our scenes to cut off the light from the foreground. This box will be the same as it was in the previous lessons. So let me bring the HDRI just as I did in the previous lessons. I'll assign it to the Corona Color Correct right away. Let's see if we have low poly layers turned on and immediately jump into interactive. And right off the bat, we want to boost the exposure of the HDRI. So that we can see something. We can rotate it so it illuminates the scene a little bit more from the right side. As we can see at the moment, it shines from the left by default. We are looking at the darker part of the sky and I'd like to look at a brighter one. So we have to turn it like this. Now we have a nice gradient here. As for the tone mapping, we have ACES enabled here, but we are going to operate on pretty low ranges and deep shadows. So you'd have to add a tone curve here, put it in front of ACES and boost those lower regions here. I think it's the simplest option to control it when using ACES. With these values, we should get something more or less similar to the filmic. We can compare it. We have filmic here. And we have the ACES here. The shadows are deeper here. But I think that in the end, as we add artificial lights, this scenario will come out quite nicely. So for now, it's still dark, no matter what. But we remember from the previous lesson that we don't have to worry about that because we are going to add light in layers. And just out of curiosity, we can add curve here and take a look at the histogram. We see that apart from it being compressed down, we have this peak of highlights here, not much higher than half of the image. And all midtones and shadows are compressed here, practically to the very bottom. So you can say that the tonal ranges are quite low. It's perfectly fine at this stage. Of course, we still lack an aerial perspective here. We look at the horizon and it's practically black. So Aerial perspective is nothing new. We have done it many times already. 
will enclose the scene with a giant box, or at least the part of the scene where we have these mountains. We won't use the box in the area strictly around the building. And we'll assign Corona volume material on this box. And we'll try to tweak up some value that will look good. We don't want to make thick fog, for sure. We're going for something barely noticeable. We want this effect to be visible primarily in the background. It's not supposed to be a thick fog, just a slightly increased value of these shadows. Here we can add some blue to the scattering. It's a little bit brighter, and also a blue tint appears. With these values, the tint will be barely noticeable, but it won't hurt to tweak it. As always, we'll get some naturalism here. So, this way we've set up the base of the scene. Piece of cake. We've done this many times before, but it's only now that we start to make decisions sequentially. And our first at this stage of decision making is the relighting. So we want the silhouettes, shapes and the materials to be readable. As we said before, we can afford to lift the base a little. It's very rare for everything to look perfect at this stage. So we need to help it with relighting. We've been talking about the relight for a few lessons now and we hope you're slowly getting used to the concept. It allows us to bring any light anywhere, just to make the picture look a bit nicer. First, we think of what we would like to achieve in, and we put the light in, to get the exact effect. And here, the building is obviously quite dark, and the materials aren't very readable, so we can improve it. We'll introduce the corona spheres here, diversify their brightness, and improve the readability of the whole composition. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we'll start by setting up a corona light sphere here in front of one of those illuminated facades. The darker one. And we'll give it some random size and intensity, at least by now. We have to lift it a bit to get it off the ground. The sphere begins to illuminate the facade and we generally have the option to change the visibility of the sphere here. We certainly don't want it to be visible directly, so we uncheck visible directly. We also don't want the sphere to appear somewhere behind the glass. Of course now, we have it in front of the building, but if it was moved somewhere, we wouldn't want it to be seen through the windows. Generally, we want to hide it, so we uncheck visible in refractions. We also don't want it to influence how other lights behave, so we also click on these. We won't render caustics in the scene anyway and we'll stop for a moment at visible in reflection. Leaving visible in reflection turned on generally improves the credibility of this illumination a bit, but sometimes those specular highlights can be just too strong. Sometimes we may want to use this option. This will be the only parameter for the relighting we'll juggle with on and off. If we turn it off somewhere here, for example, in the glass, this reflection disappears. And as a side note, if we had visible in refractions turned on, 
we would keep the reflection in the glass anyway. The glass is multi-layered and we think we might turn it off, but it will be visible in reflection. Okay. We don't see the sphere anywhere, but at the same time, the quality of illumination on the facade has changed. We had a lot of nuanced highlights before and the whole thing seemed a lot brighter, but after turning it off, we have diffuse light on the facade. It's definitely brighter than it was a moment ago without this light, because it was simply black. However, it's a completely different kind of illumination. So let's figure out how to light up the facade. Illuminating the facade and controlling how the light affects the entire scene can be tricky. Here, the chairs and the plinth of the railing are illuminated, which is a little bit unwanted. It's hard to control both things at the same time. Fortunately, we can make it way simpler. We can use the option Exclude Objects here. If we click on it, a list will open. We can change Exclude to Include. Now, any object we add here by clicking this plus and selecting it in the viewport will be included. And at that moment, this sphere only affects the stone here. Everything else is unaffected in any way. There is no light on this pedestal here, or on the chairs. It affects the stone only. We have no unwanted reflections, highlights, or glare issues on different objects. Now we can make adjustments to this sphere. We are going to increase it a little and Weaken the intensity. We want to give it a bit colder colors. I think 8K so that it's related to the atmospheric light more. And I'll try to enable the visible in reflection. Now the sphere is weaker in terms of these lights, so maybe it won't generate so many highlights. Let's see. Let's make it a little bit brighter. We have a stone here somewhere that will cause some highlights to appear. It's not necessarily bad. This nuance is quite nice. I think we should aim with the brightest light at this nook by the window because it will be the most interesting point. And I think that this lighting, with the visible in reflection on, will work well for this wall. And if we have these lights set, we'd like to give the whole thing a bit of an oomph now, to emphasize the corner. Now it disappears completely, and we want to make the individual fragments of the wall differ a little more from each other. So let's just copy the sphere. As you can see, we achieve this effect just by copying the sphere. And remember that the copied sphere also has include for facades only, so it causes no trouble in this scene. But we want to do something more here. We'll change the light type to disk and introduce a directional light here. We will move it back and upwards a bit. can make this disk a little bigger. And let's give it a target so that it's easily targetable. We'll aim with this target somewhere around the corner. We can always increase the directionality to 1 
and then we'll see exactly which place we are eliminating. So basically, we see that we shine right into this wall. And now we are eliminating the lower corner a bit more. Now that we have set it, we can change the directionality to something more useful, like 0 0.7, 0 0.6, we've got it. We illuminate facade and at the same time we create a nice gradient. Maybe we'll even create this gradient from this corner down. Maybe it will be more interesting this way. As we can see, it's dark here and it's light here. Now it's a matter of adjusting the intensity because it's probably too strong. Let's go lower with it and we have what we wanted, more or less. So here's the brightest spot and here we have the darkest one. This gradation of the facade emphasizes the corner in particular. Here the light is a little bit weaker, but it also brings out the quality of the facade on this side. We can always return to the light intensities later. The perception of the building will change more than once when we'll add the artificial lights, so don't get too attached to this look. But for now, I think it's pretty decent. It may not be 100% realistic, but it's just fine. Photographers also artificially boost many elements in their evening shots of architecture in a more or less obvious way. And when we add the rest of the lights, we'll look at this gradient as something completely natural. The question is if visible imperfection gives us a bit of a nuance. Stronger highlights in a place where this wall is a bit more glossy. And does it enliven the whole thing? The last touch when it comes to this scene could be illuminating this chimney. Because it's so dark at the moment. And it blends with the background. So I will just move the light here. We remember it's still included just on this wall. So for now we won't be able to illuminate this chimney because it's a different object. But I'll add this chimney, this metal here. And we should get some light coming from this side. Now let's adjust the sphere here to make this lighting more attractive. We don't want it to be too bright, but I think subtle glow will do the trick here. Okay, and that's it for the initial relighting. Time to go to the next step, which are interior lights. We have a glazed ground floor, as you can see. We have a first floor where there aren't too many windows. And in the previous lesson, we mentioned that most often we try to evenly fill the interior with light at least in the scenes where we have the exterior and this interior takes like 5-10% of the frame. This is not a visualization of the interior. It's supposed to be just an element of the image. We are to see it as a separate space. So we don't want to put too much diversity here anyway because it will distort our perception a bit. So we want it to be uniform but I can already say that it may be more tricky here because part of this room is visible all the way through. There are windows on both sides. So even if we illuminate it really strongly, we wouldn't be able to illuminate the other side behind the building. But it's all cool. Even in a situation like this, we can work it out. So let's get to the point. Maybe I'll switch to wireframe and let's start with setting up the coronosphere. A small one.
But maybe before we do this, let's isolate the building from its surroundings. It doesn't make sense to render all these scars. This way we can work a little more efficiently. So I'll turn it off for now. Let's take the building. I'll deselect all scatters. No worries. This way it should be much faster. When it comes to temperature, we are aiming for something warm. I think 3500 will be just about right. Let's put the sphere somewhere, maybe in two thirds of the height, so they don't interfere with our furniture. And surely we are going to have to increase the intensity of this light here. For now, let's give it 500 and we'll come back to that. And now we want to put them inside. Let's start from this side. I will try to set four like this and remember to copy them as instances. It will be important so we can easily modify them all at the same time, like their size, colors, etc. And you don't have to be obsessive about it. Try to keep them even, but it doesn't have to be super precise either. Try to copy them in groups. More or less. And again, another one here. We can already see that something is starting to light up. Now I can copy all these lights and go further. I can continue without empty spaces or do them in these arrangements. Maybe I'll do it cause it's always a little more interesting. Something like that. I have to throw out the lights in the kitchen block. And we make them more present at this table, so there's more lighting here. And the whole thing is too light for now, so we can easily reduce its size a bit. So we see that a large number of smaller lights gives us quite a uniform lighting. We expected this. We can see that we have got relatively uniform lighting of the ceiling, while the walls are noticeably darker. That's what we expected too. There's a different material here, but since our lights are instances, we can easily modify them. I just changed their size, but we can go even further and for example change them into spots. Let's change this sphere to a disk and make all the lights as ceiling spots. I'm going to select the whole thing and move it, so it's almost in the ceiling. We can make it even smaller, so it looks more like the spots. And the brightness, of course, has to be bigger. We can also play with some directionality, but we want it to stay relatively wide. Because we want those cones to blend together in a sense. If the directionality was too big, it won't illuminate the walls too much. And 
if we end up with the visible fragments of the wall that are not illuminated, they will be very separate and individual. So I think all four is the max we should consider. Maybe even 0.35 would be better. We can see that the similar lighting of the interior may be slightly weaker. The ceiling is now a little bit darker, but the walls are definitely brighter and the whole thing is a little bit more correlated. Now the ceiling has a very similar brightness and color as the walls have. Although, of course, it has a different material. Earlier, a similar amount of light fell on both the ceiling and the walls directly from the spheres. And now, the ceiling is illuminated only by reflected light. So we can see this kind of bleeding of color here. Also, the ceiling lighting intensity is smaller and this uniformity is better. In addition, we see that the very contact between the walls and the ceiling is emphasized even more by this shadow. This area receives the least light, but that's okay. It helps us understand what's going on inside. I will try to turn on the visible directly option. We should notice the spots of light directly. Of course, we don't turn visible in refraction on as well, because we look through the glass and see the spots directly here. We see them reflected somewhere in the glass, so we have some tangible sources of this light. Of course, in interactive with the bloom and glare, it often looks pretty chaotic, but we can expect that it will have a better quality in the production render. And let's note that with the building at this distance, we don't have to go as far as to model the lighting fixtures because this kind of detail simply won't be noticeable at this level. Okay, this is how it looks in the context of the whole scene, the facade. Maybe we can add some more intensity here. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool now. We still need to illuminate the first floor, which is much simpler case, because we only see a section of this room here, in the window, and we'll use a simple solution to make it. I'll copy four spots like these, maybe this time not as instances, but as a copy. I put them somewhere in the middle of the room and switch to spheres this time. The room is lit, but we can modify it a bit. I would like the spheres to be bigger and weaker at the same time, so that the light is softer. I also don't want to see them, of course, in any way, and move them somehow so they are not necessarily in one line in this room, but would rather illuminate from everywhere. That's enough for the lighting on this floor. We can add a bit of a punch to the bottom floor though, and I would like to use this kitchen block for it. There's a kitchen countertop in the dominant part of the interior. And I added the simplest under cabinet lighting here. I used the corona rectangle and meshed it. More or less to this area. It 
it has to be stronger, of course. I'll set the directionality to zero for now. Let's see where this rectangle is in the scene. And let's try to put it under this counter. Let's turn on visibility for this to see it. It will be useful to see it in the reflection, but the view of the bright white stripe is, is also attractive. At least I like it. And I'm not going to hide it. It gives a certain directionality to this interior. It's a pretty cool thing. I'll just make sure that it fits well. I see it doesn't fit very well because it's close to what's above in front of the cabinets. So I have to put it back a bit. Okay, now it makes more sense. Okay, that would be enough for the interior lighting for now. And we can go to the next step, that is the architectural lighting. Let's reduce the light from the relight a bit at this stage, as it seems a bit too strong. We don't have much architectural light, to be honest. Let's turn the whole scene on again. I'm going to dim the light a bit. So here we have this stone block. We have a wall here behind the building. But it's not much and to be honest, this part of the building works better in an image if it's left dark in the context of the light interiors. We have mentioned it in the previous lesson that these two elements can be both bright at the same time. If we illuminate the architecture more, then we should counter it with a darker interior and vice versa. And I think that adding some lighting points and sconces to this architecture seems grotesque. We just want to make this dark, cold stone wall contrast with this background of this warm, bright, wooden interior. So we can work on the latter part a bit more, that is, the feeling of warmth and illumination. The interior is, of course, already illuminated, but we can still adapt a few architectural tricks that will additionally enhance the readability of this whole block. First of all, we could illuminate this visible fragment of a wooden wall, this way, we'll have better continuous readability of this bright area. Especially when this wall is at the same depth as the windows. And this way, the inner capsule is illuminated as a whole. And in order to do this, let's simply create a rectangle. There's a wall somewhere here. So, just as we illuminated the countertop, we'll create a rectangle here. Move it so you can see it. Now you can't see much because the intensity is low. We need to increase it and change the temperature from very cold to very warm. We'll adjust the size. It may be a little bit smaller. And something like this is okay. We can make this light more visible here.
and is already a little bit more integrated. Maybe it should be a little weaker. We have a kind of continuity when it comes to the readability of this interior. This element merged with it in terms of brightness and color. So the first step is done. The next thing we could boost up in architecture is a general readability of the soffit of the block. I mean the elements that we have on the ground floor, this levitating fragment. We can illuminate it from the bottom. At this moment uh, we have some light, primarily from the inside. If we could unify this, increase this illumination in this range, then we would get a very consistent distinction between the luminous ground floor and the dark first floor. Since we care about uniformity, we'll do it with linear lights and we'll put them here. Maybe I will copy the light we had before. I will rotate them so they beam upwards. Let's put it somewhere here on the line of this tinware. Just somewhere at the level of the floor. And I don't want to see that light directly. We can even disable reflection. We can set a smaller directionality. We don't want this beam to be too strong and I think that with less intensity. Again, the reflector shouldn't be super intense. We already start to see that the brightness of the soffit is improving. And of course, uh, we have to do the same on this wall too. Maybe I'll break it down here into two elements. So I can control this one element under the stone with one light and the second one to control this wooden element on the side. We have two different materials, so it's always better to have two different lights, because one may require some warmer, more intense light. So why not? I will make a copy here. I'm going to increase the size to cover this entire area. And perhaps more intensity would be in order here. Now the ranges are similar and in this maybe I'll reduce it a bit. Let's say 200. Now the whole thing should blend more and we see that the readability between the ground floor and the first floor has definitely increased and that's for the better. I think the last thing we could do is to somehow manage this dark fragment. At the moment it's not very pleasant so taking advantage of the fact that this illumination is reaching this area we could let it in here. Just like we did with the lights illuminating this wood will use very similar lights to illuminate this wall. And bring out this cool pattern of the stone at the same time. Let's increase it to cover everything under the contour of the building, more or less. Of course, this is far too strong at the moment, maybe a bit too warm. And we can experiment with more directionality to make this stone pattern stand out even more. Look at it here. I think it's well placed. So we get a nice lighting.
Maybe I will experiment with this position again. Now I think it's perfect. We can work a little bit more on this darker element here, for example. I think it would be a good idea to continue with it outside. We'll make an instance here. And even pull it out somewhere here. This way, a little more of that light will fall here. Maybe I will do it as a copy. It will be safer. And we will have some more control. I don't necessarily want these elements to be visible directly, like these, so I will copy them as copies, and I will also disable them directly. But I think it helps here and with this diffused light, we don't have this uniform line going on down here. There's more going on here, and it looks much more attractive. Okay, I think it's pretty cool. The stage of architectural lighting is done. I think, in this scenario, it was strongly connected with the interior lighting. It had a common goal. We simply wanted to emphasize a certain architectural rule in both, indoor and architectural lighting. And I think we did it quite well. We can always copy some light and change it to a sphere if we think it's still too dark here. For example, in this area. The sphere easily illuminates everything uniformly. Let's lower it and increase the size. The larger the sphere, the more uniform the light. And of course, we have to change the intensity. It would be best if the sphere was quite delicate in terms of intensity and larger. This way, it will simply fill the area with light more uniformly. Let's check it without a sphere. This corner is very dark. With the sphere, it's way more pleasant. So, let's leave this sphere in the scene. And just like that, we have finished the architectural lighting. Now we can move on to the last step. Beside the architecture and interior relight, the landscaping lighting. And before we do, let's think again about the readability of the facade and silhouette of the building itself. Sometimes you can get the right readability through added lighting, like architectural lights, but we will show you how you can still improve something here. We'll try to cheat a bit in this step and pretend that the light from our building radiates to the surroundings more than it actually is. By the way, we'll try to glue everything together and make some elements stand out more in terms of composition and setting the building. We can start with the overall readability of the building silhouette. The background is not uniform. There's a bit of a sky here, but most of the background is a dark forest in this building. Even with the corona sphere boosting it, the levels are close to the forest and it's all blending a bit into one thing. And to help that, uh, I will simulate that the light shines on this forest from the back of the building somewhere. 
we'll copy some spheres. We need the corona sphere and we'll put it right here behind the building somewhere. So it won't be visible there in any slot. Let's raise it so it's above the ground. And of course, we need to increase the size accordingly. We want to illuminate a large part of the forest. Maybe let's crank up the intensity too. Something starting to happen. Let's copy one sphere, a little one, to reinforce it further. Let's take them to this area here. Maybe let's turn on visible in reflection for everything. This should unify the impact of it. We can see that it's improving now. We'll give it a little bit more though. I will reduce the intensity. Because we have illuminated the background, this block of the building pops up even more. I can place one more similar sphere somewhere here, so that the light effect on the forest continues. And that's enough. Now, all of the sudden, the readability of the shape of the building is nicely visible. Maybe this area could be improved, but that's not a problem, because everything is readable and that's enough. Just to remember not to illuminate the whole forest wall. The tops should be still dark. We illuminate just the lower part of the forest floor. So we are not losing this cool contrast with the sky. This cool sense of mystery associated with the forest. We don't illuminate it as a whole, but just certain areas to bring out the silhouette. I think we could add some more relighting on the facade because now with these surroundings, uh, the difference has become smaller, but I think it's still okay. Okay, now we would like to introduce a similar luminosity in front of the building, as we did behind it. Although these lights from inside shed light on this terrace, but there's relatively little of it. It would be nice to have the whole terrace bathed in warm light, and to do it, we would have to go back to being very casual in thinking about the light and to this cheating we mentioned at the beginning. The source of light should be the entire interior, so you can build a light based on it. For example, on the geometry of the glass, like this large glass here. We could build a light source based on it so that it shines outside. It would illuminate the outside, imitating the natural light of the interior. Let's do it. I will copy this rectangle that I have here. It's at least already rotated parallel to the glass. Of course, we need to enlarge and rotate it so it shines outside. And we created a portal light. That is, we are trying to create a light that will be identical to glass here. So we have to adjust these dimensions to the size of the window. Let's set the directionality to zero. We make sure to have it in front of the glass so as not to illuminate something in the glass. We don't need that. And less intensity as far as I'm concerned. 
It's not supposed to be a very intense light, but rather something that will just create a little bit of that directional nuance. For example, on this soffit or within those reflections. Without this light, the railings are quite dark and the soffit is kind of uniform. And with the light, we get a delicate nuance here. But of course, this doesn't solve the problem of the terrace lighting all the way through. And we address it in a slightly different way. We'll simply light it with the rectangle from up top. So we can copy it again and this time point it straight down, straight to the terrace. Let's increase the size a bit. just so we illuminate the terrace. We can definitely increase directionality because otherwise we just shine on surroundings. I think five is okay. Intensity may be a little bit bigger. The temperature seems quite warm to me and it's okay. It's okay because the texture on this terrace is rather desaturated and higher temperature we make up for it a bit. This whole terrace line is a pixel thin and it seems much brighter and it gives the impression of a luminosity that's spilling away on the stones and I think it looks a lot more attractive now. We can copy and light up the front part of the terrace the same way. along with those stairs leading to this water spring. We won't illuminate them in any other way, so let's make sure this light also covers this fragment. This part may be weaker. My main concern is for that glow to appear, but not too intense. I think it's cool. And that's pretty much it for that extra relighting. We see the light we had thanks to it and we have made it seem more impactful on the environment all around. It's like that light from the back of the building, from the front of the building, was illuminating the surroundings. The whole thing seems so much cozier. We have a strong urge to be there, while the terrace, that's the focus of the image, finally stands out as it should. Okay then, the last layer of the lighting will be the landscape lighting. We finished every detail of the building, but its surroundings are still a dark spot. It may actually work with this composition, but it couldn't hurt if they would play well together. We will try to introduce lighting to bring back some compositional values, but not as strong as to make the perception that the building is the subject of the image. Let's start building the sliding step by step. We focus on silhouettes, rhythms and filling. This is the last step. Stick with us, everything will be clear soon. Let's start from the beginning. As for the silhouettes, we want to emphasize there's a tree and a slope on the left. The lamps along the vegetation will also immediately increase the commercial value of the foreground. It will transform a wild area into a designed garden. Illuminating plants, especially from the back, and bringing out their silhouettes is a very popular and cool trick. In addition, translucency goes to works and softens this effect. We could get a similar effect by illuminating the line of the boulders on the right. During the day, it was a very strong compositional element and it would be nice to recover some of it. We'll use discs and rectangles to highlight the silhouettes for the most part, because we want to have as much light control as we can. 
Light fixtures used for backlighting are usually hidden behind illuminated objects, so we should get away with not showing them at all. We can even form these lights a bit abstractly, a bit like relight, and it should also give us a reasonably natural effect. A simple rectangle set at a wide angle is enough to illuminate the line of the boulders on the right. So maybe let's start with that. Let's create a rectangle again. It may be a little cooler this time. We don't want everything to be super warm. We also want to keep some of the natural colors, especially in the landscaping. Turn it around parallel to these stones. We can rotate it a little bit, so that we can catch the light right on that edge. If we turn the visible in reflection on, we should see it better. We can still play around with directionality, increase it, for example. Now, this light is definitely stronger, maybe even too strong. Now, it seems to be better. We obviously have a lot of lights behind the stones as well, but I like it because we also like to illuminate these junipers a little. Maybe just a smidge. We also want to make sure nothing's brighter than the building itself. We could copy this light. Turn it vertically down. Reduce it. And light this junipers up. Of course, now, it's hard to tell if it works or not, because we can't see much on this low poly layer. Let's set a smaller directionality, maybe. We instantly light up the dark side of these stones. If this is okay, we can reduce the intensity so as to not overdo it. It should be just a nuance in this area. I think it's okay. We also don't want to pour that much of this light into the lawn, because we are going to need this shade here later when we introduce the other light. Now that we have got that area covered, let's move on to the slope on the left. It won't be so easy with the lighting of the edge of this tree and the slope, because it's a much larger area, and we'll have to solve it with more than one light. However, the principle is the same. We can start by inserting a rectangle here. Let's throw it in perpendicularly to the ground and somewhere towards the camera. We are starting to see it now. We will have to move it a bit this way. Let's make it a little bit warmer. 
And of course, we need a much higher intensity. It already shines very clearly, even too bright right now. But it's already something we can work with. Let's try to move it here. We want to lose some highlights in this area. Let's lower it. It collides with this wall here, but it's not important. We have kind of illuminated this edge, but without catching too much light. So it's better here. As for the intensity, we can reduce it. Maybe we could even turn in like this, literally by 10. We'll define the silhouette better this way. There won't be as much light here. We can't cut it off from the foreground entirely. But we could use exclude to reduce the lighting on these bushes here. It doesn't work for us, so I'm excluding it. except I think it's grouped. No, it's just one object. And it's low poly anyway, so we'll have to deal with it in the final render anyway, and exclude another object. For now, we can leave it as it is. And we have to try to remember to exclude these bushes in the foreground in the final render. But for everything else, I think we can leave this light as it is. If the slope is done, all we need to do is to illuminate the tree in this part. And we could solve it the same way with a rectangle, but we are going to bring more freshness in here and use a disk, or disks. You'll see if it works with just one. Let's put the corona disk just as we did before and place it somewhere on the grass level to at least suggest that this is a real light. Let's set a target. We're suggesting that there's some sort of physically existing reflector, but we won't really introduce it here. And we want these light sources to be small, so we have to turn the intensity up. Set the radius on 3 and the intensity about 12,000. I think it should give a real power to this light. Now, all we have to do is hit the tree with it, which isn't always easy with such thin objects and low light. The fog is a bit distraction here, so I'll set it to display as box, and maybe I'll turn on snap and try to snap it somewhere in the area of this tree. And the light is already getting there, so it's okay. And as before, we don't want to illuminate the entire tree, but just bring out this edge. Up until now, we are lucky with bringing this edge out with this reflector. The directionality is at 0.6, 
which is quite good because it shines as we wanted it to. Let's try to make it a little bit smaller. And now we are losing the backlight on this edge. So 0.6 is pretty cool. We have this backlight the way we want it. We can raise the intensity a little, but we'll need another spotlight to illuminate the top part with leaves. So we can copy the slides and we put them on the side. It doesn't matter. We can see where it's coming from anyway. We just try not to go too low, not to go into the grass, because we don't want any highlights on the grass. Let's try to aim the spotlight here, maybe using snap again, though it went crazy. Go vertically up here to illuminate this part. It's starting to work fine. We could try to set a little less directionality here. And on the other hand, go for more intensity so that we can operate with this light more freely. Maybe not so much. We want to start catching it from here and spreading it all over the edge of the upper branches of the tree. And it's way better. I just don't know which light illuminates this leaf. It's probably this one. A single leaf shines so much here. It must be because of this light. I guess it's a separate object, so I could exclude it again. Where's that leaf? It's a separate object, so we are going to take advantage of that and exclude it from this light. Unless we want it to be illuminated, but if we exclude it, it will be a little bit calmer. However, it may be strange that it casts a shadow, but there's no light on it. So it's up to us. It's not a big deal if it stays in the light. We can dial it down in post-production, so the left side is done and illuminated. Now I see that the light is a little bit too bright here at the bottom. So I'll go down a bit. It seems better now. And then there's the lawn. We got the silhouettes on the left and on the right sorted out. And it's time to introduce rhythms to the scene. In the previous lesson, we have mentioned that rhythmic lighting makes it easy to enliven in the space. It naturally guides our eyes. It's a cool compositional tool. And here, on the right, we have a line of junipers. We can't see them well in this low-poly variant, but we can see on this scheme that there's a line of junipers there. Can you see those blobs with scatters and individual plants on them? Those are the junipers. We can use that line to press the light points up against it. And then we turn them to the left. We can set some ISs, pretty narrow ones, and outline a clear rhythm of light and shadow on the plane of the lawn. And note that this time we can't do it without light fixtures. When we illuminated these edges before, 
we could do so from a distance of many meters. It was easy for us to sell on the idea that this lamp physically exists out there, even if we don't show it, like this hidden spotlight that illuminates the tree. And it's normal that these spotlights just are not in plain view as we look around the garden. But if something starts to shine on the lawn, a couple of centimeters from the light source, we can't get away with it. And we have to put these spots in there somewhere for it to look more believable. Fortunately, we have the spotlights prepared and uploaded for the scene, so we can throw them in. Let's lift them up so they are not completely in the grass. We need to create a light source that will also associate with the spotlight. So I'm going to create a corona disk again. And I'll turn it so it's the same direction as the spotlight. And I will assign a narrow IS to it. I choose narrow bright from the corona list. You can even make the diameter smaller. In terms of intensity, we're probably going to need something bigger. At this point, directionality doesn't matter because we shine with eyes anyway. However, this cone of light is already turning out nicely, so it's okay. Now we need to place this so we can group it as one. And rotate it so that it's perpendicular to the camera, more or less. So here we go. Let's start somewhere in this area. We see the line of junipers here. We will use it as a guide, more or less. So copy each of them as an instance and try to keep equal spaces between objects while pressing them into the junipers from the right. I will just start to arrange these objects. And we have already created this rhythm. Light, shadow, light and shadow. So it works. And let's see. We'll keep copying it until we get to the end. It's getting a bit cramped because of that tree as far as the view goes, but we should be able to fit another one in somewhere here. Let's wait until it renders a little bit more. It gives us a distinct rhythm on the lawn. Even in the low poly variant, with the rugged glass full of holes, it's starting to look good. Now, if we would like to modify it somehow, all these objects are instances. So we can simply ungroup it and modify this light as we see fit. Change the slides, change the intensity. We have full freedom. We could also decide to move these slides down a bit or bury them deeper into the ground. Then those cones of light there would probably even thinner. Let's try to select them all and go literally two centimeters down. We should see an even greater distinction because this cone starts lower, above the ground, 
it's not able to go sideways that much and I think that it will help us build this area even more. So to sum up, we made the edges visible and we found a place to introduce the rhythm which serves as a guide to the composition. We have built the entire layout of our landscape lighting in a sense and now all we have to do is consider we want to fill some of these dark areas with light. I mean those dark spaces separated within this layout that we have left. And there's a kind of an elephant in the room that we haven't illuminated yet. is the pond with the stairs from the terrace. Some light is already falling in on it. Everything is bathed in light beautifully. But the water area hides in this unpleasant shade doesn't make you want to go swimming after dark. The commercial aspect of the image would be even greater for sure if you solved this pool well, and it would certainly be an important selling point of the entire investment. That's a no-brainer. Fortunately, it's a fairly simple task. As we click on the water material, It has volumetric scattering turned on. This means the light from the submerged light fixtures will be distributed in the water very regularly. It behaves a bit the same way as if the light was shining through the fog. We have familiar values in the settings. Absorption, scattering, distance and directionality. It's the same behavior we already know from Corona volume material and we will explore it in depth in future lessons. And what's important to us is that, thanks to its relatively low distance value, it will be easily to diffuse the light in the water. Let's see how it works. The most popular option for lighting a pool like this is putting spotlights in the basin walls. So again, I'll create a corona disk. In addition, plating spots this way creates a kind of an extra rhythm. But in this case, when the pool is small and round, it won't be an important aspect. At least, not for us. So, let's create a disk underwater. We can assign eyes to it, but this time we are going for something soft. So we will give it a spotlight soft. As for the size, choose the smaller one, about six centimeters big. When it comes to light color, let's go for a clear blue to make the blueness of the water even more pronounced. And the intensity will be probably relatively big. We are already starting to see this spot here somewhere. The question of height is yet to be determined. We can start copying the spots. I'll copy them to the opposite wall here, as an instance. It doesn't matter if we can't match them to the stone irregular wall. It's not a problem. The distance and foreshortening of this light is too big to tell whether they are against the wall or not, so it's not a problem for us. Of course, I want a view instead of local. Let's create about 12 of these lights. I'll turn it around and throw out the light under the stairs because I don't want it to shine unnecessarily on the stairs and grab too much attention. And the pool is much more attractive basically right away. Now we just have to decide how high do we want to have these lights 
and match their position. If we leave them quite high, we'll get this blue glow above the middle and on these stones. This can be attractive to us, and if we don't want it, then we'll submerge the light more. With this angle, this light would get out. If I would submerge it somewhere here, you can immediately see that there's less light in these areas. As far as I'm concerned, we can submerge it a bit. On the other hand, I liked the blue glow on these stones. So I could rise just those four lights a bit, for example. We won't see precisely where these lights are, and at the same time, we are going to catch some of that cool glow here that works for the appeal of the area. So again, we cheat a little to make the image more attractive. We can also make such a gentle relight in the whole pool area. Let's use a big blue disc for it, with some very low intensity. I think below one. Or maybe not below one. We want to catch some of that blue glow in the surroundings, on these stones for example. The light on the stones will go nicely with the one coming from the vignette and we'll even out the light temperature for the terrace relight, so it will light up this space nicely in that manner. And at the same time, it's not too dominant, so I think it emphasizes this zone in a great way. We can consider whether we want this to be visible in reflections or not. Surely it will matter. And in my opinion, it's better when it's visible. Okay, we are getting close to an end. The last area we need to touch on are these dark stones in the landscape. And some light comes onto them from the terrace, but it actually makes it more messy instead of unifying it. So I suggest we move this terrace relight a bit this way to tone it down. and we could illuminate it in a few different ways, like with spotlights or otherwise. I would just use this terrace relight that I already have. I'll copy this rectangle and simply create a very delicate light that will make this zone more attractive. We have to lower it. because now the light goes right on these stones. And now we have to make it softer, so it's not that noticeable. But we still don't want to have a black hole under the building. As for the temperature, the light may be cooler. I'd say a three. And we have basically come to an end. It was quite a long road. We put quite a lot of lights on the scene, a mere 96 of them. Each is task oriented. We placed all of them very consciously and as meticulously as possible. 
Now we want to render the whole thing and make final tweaks in Photoshop. Before I do that, I'll turn the render on in interactive with all layers visible. Hoping it's not going to crash and add that exclude I wanted to add. Now we see it in all its glory. We can check if there's anything new that could be disturbing or blocking the light. It seems that it's not. What's more, even those bushes that bother us before now are denser in high poly version and don't look that bad anymore. We can see their edge, but we don't have any kind of gaps in it. Let's see what else. As long as we are here, let's test it with exclude. Now the image is rendered more with a dark outline around it. Honestly, I like the glow and how it looks in this high poly version. So I'm going to go back and I'll make my piece with the scene going crazy. And basically at this stage, we can hit render. We could use the Corona light mixer here that would give us extra control over the lights after the rendering is finished. A night scene like this one is an almost perfect scenario to take advantage of it. We'll tell you more about this process in a bonus lesson though. For now, we are just going to render exactly what we have set up and jump straight into Photoshop for a quick post-production. We could set up some render elements that could be useful here. Let's check Reflect, Refract, maybe Translucency with all those lights that penetrate the greenery. And I think that's enough. We are not planning too much of a post-production because I feel it looks pretty good as it is. So we can click render and wait. Okay, the render's ready. We got these extra passes we checked. Reflect, refract, translucency, and I have wire color and masking ID check if necessary. We've had it there before and now for a fast post-production. If you want to see more advanced post-production using Lightmix, check out our bonus lesson on Lightmix. We work on the scene in it, but with an extra twist. And today, we simply focus on what we have here, on this single render, and figure out what can we improve. A few things we can correct manually, like those unfortunate bushes in the foreground. They didn't look good either way, whether they were completely dark or brightened as they are now. Luckily, we can select them here and modify them in post-production. So I'll put a curve on it and try to pull it down a bit. And we nailed it instantly. It looks already better. We could also add this crude gradient from the vignette. To darken these areas even more. I think the foreground's done. We have some more action here, but it doesn't draw too much attention. There are a few other things that annoy me though. The first one is that bluish glow from the pool right here. It's cool, but it's only on a couple of stones and everything else is in the shadow. It seems quite arbitrary to me. It should be everywhere or nowhere. 
So I would select these objects and try to desaturate them. Let's create a new layer. Take this color from here. Put the layer on the color and try to desaturate this area. It already looks better. We can create one more layer. This time on some multiply and darken it a little bit, but not too much. Let it fade into the background here. I think it looks better with some bluish tint. So we have cleared that. I think the relationship of those blue glosses to the warm light looks pretty cool. Also, everything that's happening on the terrace is okay. We could just try to introduce some subtle difference between those two tones within this meadow. Maybe I'll just gently lift it on the curve. Let's do a mask gradient from this side, just to make the corner a little brighter. I think it will help with the readability of this block and this bend right here. It's a small corner, but I think this nuance here is pretty cool. Another thing that still annoys me is the light on these stones here. It already annoyed me in the scene. Again, we have two or three stones in the light and it looks kind of random. So let's select this area here, more or less, and create a new layer with color. Take some of that color from the surrounding stones. I'll make a pass on the borderline. Maybe not that big. Some of that light would stay here, so we reduce the opacity a bit to 55, but I think it fits better as a whole now. And we can create one more layer and run it on multiply as well. Apply blending only to bright areas, just as we did before. So we lower those highlights and of course reduce the opacity, just to make it a little bit brighter. Yes, I think it's better. Now the area is a little bit more uniform, which is good and I like it. We have this leaf here that shines like crazy, but honestly, it doesn't bother me that much. Maybe I could darken it a bit. Let's try select it. We'll see how it reacts to it. The edges of this mask are a little bit rugged, so I'll go over it with a soft brush. I think lowering the brightness helps a bit, so let's leave it like that. And probably the last thing that annoys me in terms of corrections that I can do manually is the stone here. It's very cold, while the stone here is quite warm even though it's in the shade. And I'm wondering if we can address it somehow. Let's see. And there will be a problem with this mask, but we can fix it later. Let's try to pour some of the colder color onto it. Lower the opacity so it's not so crude.
I think it helps a bit. A moment ago, these surfaces seemed quite different. This one was warm, even in the shadow. That one was cold overall. Now I think that it all blends well together. So I think we are done with the small corrections. And now maybe we can go over the colors. Actually, maybe not yet. Before we go into colors, I wanted to boost reflection on the glass. Of course, at the moment, the outside is dark, the inside is bright, so we mostly see just the interior. And I wanted to add some new ones, so I'll select the glass. I have a mask rendered with all the glass on the separate color, but I think this should be enough. So let's take the reflect, copy that part and add a curve on this layer. Just to raise these darker areas up, the one that's dark blue here. At the same time, we not necessarily want to make all the other areas brighter. So let's set this layer as a lighten now. And I'm basically going for this magenta glow. I think it will give a cool touch on the glass. We have some other stuff here. This selection wasn't very fortunate because we selected a part of the facade. So I'll delete it. And on top of that, I'll add a mask here and delete all those bright things on the edge that I'm not interested in that much because they don't look very attractive. I'm mostly interested in what's going on here in this magenta. I don't want to introduce magenta here, so I'll try to turn it into something more bluish, slightly desaturated, these areas. I mean, I won't get rid of that magenta completely. It's, of course, a matter of layers where one is blue and the other is orangish, so they are intertwined and meet in this kind of magenta area. So the magenta hint will stay. On the other hand, I don't want this reflection here to be bigger. I feel like this is okay as it is. So yeah, we have added a little bit of reflection. It adds a little more charm to the glass the way I see it. And basically, at this stage, we can move on to colors. We have done some typical manual corrections that make this image a little more cohesive in my opinion. So let's move on to colors. We'll control them with hue saturation this time. I would like to address the sky and a few items that are selected here, but we'll mask it right now. Let's add some saturation here. I feel like the sky is a bit washed out because of the aces. So I turn it a bit towards magenta and at the same time add a mask here so as not to change other blue areas the same way. Okay, I think it's cooler. Let's do the same on the layer. We'll deal with the warm tones and increase saturation some more. As for hue, I think it's okay. This wood and this grass are coming up a little more now. Everything is a little bit more punchy as the image goes. So I think it was a pretty cool move. Okay, so that's about it for this image. We could still work with the vignette a bit here.
I'll do it on soft light, but I'll stay small, only 20% of soft light. I think it will calm everything down. It will introduce a focus on the subject of visualization. Yeah. And so we are done with this part of post-production. Oh man, we almost hit the two hour mark and this is by far the longest lesson we prepared for you. Still, we hope you took a lot of knowledge from this lesson and it gives you real tools to execute many different nighttime scenarios. So you can pat yourself on the back and now you can understand how to execute all the important commercial scenarios. And the best part is that the training is not over yet. In the last module, we will have some fun. We will approach volumetric effects and it really can't get any better. So thank you again and see you in the next one.